Hi guys, uh, my name is Molly Preer. Um, I'm the VP of Workplace for OFS. Uh, we are a furniture manufacturer. We do healthcare furniture, contract furniture, education furniture. Um, and I also work with uh, all of our product development teams. So looking at ways that we can create uh, products that serve people better uh, in the workplace and make our workplaces more appealing uh, to be a part of when they are actually creating solutions that are um, helping people solve for uh, just better days. Which is hugely important right now, which we will get into. Um, <laughs> so I'll get over to Jordan. And Jordan, if you want to introduce yourselves. <laughs> yeah, my name is Jordan Carroll. I'm also known as the remote job coach. I help high performers find remote jobs. Um, I'm also the author of a book called Remote for Life. This is my co-pilot, Chandra. She'll literally sit here the entire hour. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's because I prefer to work from home. Like uh, uh, for the most part, I do go to co-working spaces or cafes every once in a while. Um, but it's hard to leave her. And I'm in Playa del Carmen, Mexico. That's great. Benefit of working uh, remotely here. Um, so before we get started, I definitely want to start from the top and just set some groundwork for everybody that's tuned in today. Um, so each panelist, can you share um, what is your current work structure at your company? So for example, is it remote, hybrid, structured hybrid? Um, how many days roughly do you go into the office a week? And does that align with where you want it to be? So how about we start with uh, Ryan again? Okay. Uh, yeah, we're currently in a, I would call it a structured hybrid model, um, but it's really more of a request from the top for three days a week in the office, but empowering the teams that are doing the work to decide what three days and who from the team is in the office on what days. Um, so there's still flexibility, even though there is the the mandate that, you know, we utilize the space and, and you know, come into the office. Okay. Now, does that align with what you would like? I think it aligns with. Here. <laughs> I think it aligns with the needs of my team because we do okay. so much service across the organization. It is helpful for us to be in the office and sit across the table as we build trust and relationship with the teams that we're there to assist. So, um, in my unique situation, I think it's a good balance. Um, but I could see other individuals or other teams with responsibilities saying I could either be in less or more. Uh, but for me, I think it's a good fit. Okay, great. And then Molly, how about you? Yeah, so uh, we're about 85% fully back in the office. Uh, we have about 10% that are in a hybrid uh, type of work mode, um, and that's really departmentally based. And then 5% uh, that are um, fully remote. Um, within the organization. So, and it, uh, it, I'm in five days a week. I try to be five days a week, every week, and it is uh, what I prefer and the way I like to work. And I think Jordan, you kind of touched on it, but tell me if you want to shed any more light. So you clearly have this ability to kind of work from anywhere, WFA, which is like yeah. an amazing thought, right? But you said sometimes you find yourself in co-working spaces or cafes. Is that, you know, how, what's, how, Often do you do that? And do you do that because you're looking for a little social interaction, a little buzz? Um, what, what's your rationale? Um, mostly if the Wi-Fi goes out at home. There you go. <laughs> um, but there are times in which I do want uh, someone to make me a drink rather than me make my own drink. So I'll go Fair. to a mm -hmm. cafe and then uh, maybe get some food. And yeah, the, the, the social aspect of it's not a huge thing for me as far as like I'm going in there to actually talk and socialize. It's just sometimes nice to have a little bit of a buzz around me, but I have no intention of like interacting with people. And actually that's more of a detriment to me. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Um, so Molly, you mentioned that you prefer to be in the office full time, um, which is great. Um, and you also probably appreciate when your team is in an office as well. Um, so tell me, why does it matter so much for you to be there with such frequency, um, you and your team, I guess? Yeah, uh, a few different reasons. I mean, when I'm, I'm in a leadership role too. So, I mean, with that caveat, it is, I think, important for me to be in the office knowing that that is a standard of the organization. However, I love it. And I think that a lot of it comes down to the synergies that are um, created amongst the team. My teammates have become some of my very best friends. Um, and so it's just about coming together, having, you know, hearing each other's mornings and how or how their night was the night before, really having just those in-depth relationship type building 
um, conversations that just really help inspire. Plus we do marketing. And so sometimes we want to get in a room and just throw out crazy ideas. And, and sometimes the formalities of Zoom and some of these different interactions you know, it's, it creates a little bit of a barrier for some of those really in-depth, wild types of conversations that we like to have in here. And we just feel like there is um, a lot of energy uh, when we're all together. Now, I say that I do have three of my teammates that are fully remote. So I am one of the groups that actually has fully remote teammates. Um, and so to that point, you know, we, we try to do as much as we can to keep the same synergies, make sure we're meeting as frequently as we need to. And then I do try to require that they come in at least quarterly so that we can spend a week together to just try and build those bonds. Um, but I also try to lead with a very high trust um, environment amongst my team. So my team that is you know, fully in the office, it's like, hey, I want to spend the afternoon with my kids or I want to work from home today. There is absolutely no time that I am going to say, nope, that's not going to work. It's whatever you need. I'm, I know what my, you know, my team, I trust my team. They trust me. We have a very great um, dynamic. And so it's really just about having leading with that trust and understanding where people need to be or want to be that day and empowering them to, to do so, to make that day the best day it is or it can be for them. That's great. Now, Jordan, what's your take on, on being in the office full-time? Do you feel that if you are fully remote, that you are missing out on those opportunities? Um, I think when we spoke previously, you said that there was nothing um, better than, you know, being in person, but that sometimes isn't always achievable. So do you think that you're, you're fully missing out being a remote participant, or do you think it's the, it's the actions by your company, your leader, your manager, whomever you're working with to make sure it's inclusive? Yeah. I mean, I think nothing replaces in person interaction. I mean, that's the truth of it. I mean, I have a, there's a couple dozen people between the teams that I have um, in my different businesses, we're across different time zones. You know, we're all over the world, distributed. Everyone's 100% remote, so that can be just it's hard to keep track of, and you don't ever get to a certain level of interaction that you could replace in person. But like, I I don't see my social circle as my coworkers. I have draw a very like big distinction between that where the social circle that I keep are the people that I want to be around after work and hang out with. And I kind of choose that as opposed to, you know, kind of having closer ties to the people socially in my, in my work. Um, but I, I, I think at the end of the day, it's just about choice. And I think what Molly's saying really resonates with me as far as, you know, if someone has something that they really needed to do, they need to be home and need to go get their kids. You know, I think as long as the choice is present, that's really what I feel like is more important in all this is how are you leveraging the ability to give people choice to do what's best for them and do what's best for the business. And instead of just knee jerk reacting to like come to the office and like that you have to come to the office to do good work instead seeing these things as different operating systems, like it just takes a different type of work to get work done when you're remote and a different type of work to get work done when you're in an office. Like instead of looking at it as just location, look at it as a different style and, and that, that does require a lot of leadership and it does require, you know, the ability to see those things. And I think there are a lot of companies who maybe didn't have the intentionality of like, we want to create a remote company. So here's the policies, here's the way that we do it. Here's that, you know, they created a, an office centric company and then they're forced to go remote. And then all of a sudden it's like, I understand why things, you know, get messed up in that way. And, and it, it makes it a lot harder. So I have a lot of empathy for, for both sides. Me personally, though, I, I just, I don't really resonate with being in office. I think if you're really young in your career, you do miss out if you're not mm -hmm. in an office. I will say that. Um, I think it's great to have like in-person mentorship for your first job for at least, you know, the first year or so. So that would be something that I would recommend for younger professionals. That's interesting, especially you could probably put that in a job description, right? And then right up front you're talking about what the requirements might be because there's been a lot of, you know, chatter about like a bait and switch, right? You get hired in, you think you're in a hybrid or a remote role and then that shifts, right? Um, so Ryan, um, when we chatted previously, I thought you had a really interesting approach. So obviously your, your office has some in-office mandates. It's more that structured hybrid approach, but it seems like your approach as a manager um, meets those requirements, but it also incorporates a bit of like task-based hybrid work, um, as well as a bit of employee autonomy, which I think is really important to employees today. So do you want to share a little bit about how you kind of approach it? Yeah, for sure. Um, 
but I will take a quick step back. I think Molly, Please do. Please yeah, do. I think Molly talked about the importance of um, being present, being accessible as a leader. And then Jordan came in and said, you know, the idea of early on in your career, the benefits of actually being surrounded by leadership or being able to observe how leadership might carry themselves. I just want uh, to reinforce that and su support those statements. I truly feel like um, there's uh, an irreplaceable opportunity for people to not just understand what a leader does, but to actually see them do it in action, how do they navigate difficult conversations? How do they introduce ideas or contradictions that might be seen as disruptive or not favorable for a project? Because they can start to mirror and learn and understand what they want to take from that interaction. And they can also see what kind of leader they don't want to be, which early on in my career, I got plenty of exposure to that. Um, <laughs> sometimes you don't get to see those interactions when everything is done off camera. So. Now I'll revert back to uh, your your question. Um, I think with my team, we are working on such a wide array of programs. It's unfair to me to say, come into the office and I'm gonna try to jam pack a single day full of all of these activities. So what I'll typically do is take a look and say, what makes sense for us this week? And I'll work with the team to figure out when should we be in. And the perfect example is I didn't plan on being on this panel from my office. But late last night, my teammate and I sat down and we said, we have a program tomorrow that we're kicking off. And we think that it will be more impactful if we can do that in person. So we made the decision, we're going to come in the office. Mm -hmm. That kind of flexibility allows individuals to feel like they have some control over what their week looks like. Um, sometimes I'll even say we have to come in for this one specific thing, but after that, if you're more productive at home, we can do that. So I'll pull those meetings, those activities towards the beginning of the day or the end of the day. And that gives some freedom for my team to do things like go to a doctor's appointment and not feel like they're leaving work early or showing up late. Um, or the simple things in life, like I got to get these bills paid or whatever it might be, because if they can show up and not have that stress on them, they can be more present in the activities that I'm asking them to facilitate. So um, I try to keep it somewhat flexible, but I also, as a leader, understand the request coming down from leadership. And it's my job to make sure that we are present. We are on site. We are accessible mm -hmm. to teams. So um, I try to find that balance. It's not always easy. <laughs> it doesn't always work, um, but that's my goal is to find that balance both for my team and for the organization. Great. Um, so I guess next question is, are these RTO mandates, so return to office mandates, um, the question is, are they here to stay, right? So in a recent article on TechBrew, um, it was showing that about 30% of workdays are being performed remotely. And about office occupancy numbers are about 50%, which has been pretty stable. Um, and, you know, we'll read some of these articles of these companies are re requiring you to get back into the office, if it's an Amazon or, or Google, not to pick on you. Um, but, and sometimes there have been some reversals around it as well. Um, but it just leads one to believe that there might not be these RTO mandates really truly across the board. So, Jordan, I know you work with a lot of like executives and I'm sure you do a lot of coaching, right? When it comes to building out these like hybrid work, remote work strategies. Um, what's your take when it comes to RTO mandates? And, you know, what do you think is the main driver? Is it because of leases? Is it big leases that are the driver? Is it just the way that people have worked and they think people work better, stronger in office? Um and are these companies really focusing on the right things, I guess? Yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of drivers. I think one of them is obviously the money from leases. And if you have a uh, an office lease and you know you have that property, it's like you're gonna want to probably use that. There's other pieces of it where again, I think it's false attribution of why things are not going as well as people think they are. So mm -hmm. say that you're not as productive as um, prior to the pandemic. I think the issue is, is that we're taking the pandemic and using it as like a data point for remote work when it's really like not a great data point. Um, it's, it skews everything and it skews it in the way in which we're doing this work from home pandemic, like ordered to be in your house 
remote work. That's not true remote work. And sure. again, there's all these companies that didn't have any intention of being remote that were then forced to be remote. So I think we're just seeing like a restabilization of like all those companies basically coming coming back. But if you look at the data, like we're actually more remote than we've ever been. So if you take the time before mm -hmm. pandemic and time after pandemic, and you just look at those data and you don't skew it with the pandemic, like obviously there's some causation sure. there, but mm -hmm. if you don't skew it with, with that and like look at remote work is going down now again, you just see that, oh man, like we're actually far above where we were before. And now it's kind of leveling out. So there's a lot of reasons why it's happening. I think culturally, you know, certain executives and certain ways that things have been done, mm -hmm. like that's how it's been done. So that's how we're going to do it. And that, that thing's that, that kind of thing is really hard to change. So, so what that, would you say to an executive if you're coaching them and that's what they said? Yeah. I mean, I think just more transparency is really what people want. Cause I, I work mostly with job seekers and like people on the other side who are, who are seeing that companies are doing that bait and switch or they're in a situation where they've been told they haven't been given a reason why they're coming back to the office. And, and look, I, like, I get it. Like not everyone's great at working remotely, just like as an individual, but sure. how is it that you're assigning incentives so that they understand where they stand and where they need to be. And that's where I think a lot of this stuff gets mixed up. And that's, that's a function of leadership is how do you create incentives? How do you create the expectations of what the output is? How do you measure performance? And just having like clear transparency around that and like, why is it important to be in the office? Like, it sounds like Ryan and Molly both have cases that they are very transparent about of like, here's why it is that we want to be in the office. Here's why it is that we want you here. Here's what we're going to be able to do that's not being done. And then, oh, by the way, if you need to work from home for this reason, go ahead. Like, I like that a lot more than, hey, you have to be back in the office and there's no conversation about it. And then you see what you see with stuff like Amazon and, and some of these other companies, so. Okay. So what do you, what does everyone think here? Do you think we'll see an increase in return to office mandates for 2024? I know Molly and I were chatting just prior to the call that um, we saw a, a study came out today that it looked like um, a significant amount of businesses are going to be downsizing their office space, which is that least conversation a little bit. So do we think the return to office mandates will increase, stay steady or fall off? Do we think, or do you think companies are going to let their employees be in the driver's seat of where they need to work or where they feel most productive. So I guess, Ryan, I'll kick it to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, I think it's really going to be industry specific. And mm -hmm. then within the industry, you could probably cut it a different way and say it's task or responsibility specific. Okay. Uh, early on when we were talking, Molly had shared that she loves the ability to be working with marketing and design and then step to the other room and actually interact with the people responsible for manufacturing that stuff. Mm -hmm you're not going to be able to achieve that as seamlessly in a remote environment. But that's not to say that environment should be measured and weighed in the same way as someone who might be doing something like uh, data entry or uh, accounting. Sure. Something you might be able to do 100% remote. So I think you're going to see these, these patterns forming in certain industries, um, which I'd be curious to see how much that might affect the future uh, interest in certain roles and responsibilities in industries. Um, that is very interesting. Um, that would be a good LinkedIn jobs. question, right? Has there been an increase in in jobs or shifts to jobs that are or can be fully remote? Um, and that's a concept that we talk about in state of hybrid work this year is task based hybrid work. So, like, there are just some functions that are better performed in the office, right? Collaboration, team meetings, any culture activities. But like, if you need focused work and to put on your headset and really crank and get something done. The office might not be the best place for it, right? So giving employees the autonomy to figure out or decide where they work best based on what they're working on, um, I feel like hopefully will be a continuing trend. Um, but to flip the narrative a little bit, you know, like they're the, the mandate side for whatever reason it might be, the way we've done it, leases, um, how do you entice or inspire? And I think Molly, that's where you so uniquely sit here. I think it's such an interesting perspective, but like, how do you inspire and invite back versus it making it feel like it's a chore or something you have to do? Yeah. Well, and first I couldn't agree more with what is being said by, by Ryan and Jordan about just the dynamics. And, and it's, 
you know, we tried to not, and I, I hope that every company is, isn't sitting back looking for some prescriptive answer as to what that it's supposed to look like. Because if you're doing that, you might as well close up shop and just, <laughs> just head home. Because I feel like what we have to do is really look inward at, at our companies, at our cultures, departmentally, again, back to the job functions that are taking place. What needs to happen in the office and what can happen in a remote environment? And it doesn't have to be so polarizing. It doesn't have to be so one or the other. It can actually be a beautiful combination of all of it when we really start to like look inward and strategize around what we're trying to achieve as an organization. And I think that that will open up the door. And it goes back to that transparency conversation that Jordan was talking about is that if we can be just transparent in, in the why behind those, you know, those things, those uh, things we're setting in place. I think you're going to start to see a lot more buy-in from employees. And, you know, from, from the question that you're asking me, one of the things that I think has been so undervalued by organizations in the past is the spaces that they're creating for their employees. Yeah. You want your employees to come back to a cold, stale, uninviting, uh, unsupportive type of environment that does no good for me to get my job at hand done or my team then why would I choose to come? I'm going to go take my team and meet at the local coffee shop. And because we like the vibe, we feel supported. We have the energy that we need. I don't want to go back into a situation where I was stuck in the sea of sameness that didn't work for me to begin with. And then the pandemic sh you know, sent me home. I found a vibe, an energy that worked for me, whether that's in my home, whether that's at a local you know, spot that my team and I come together or just I go to work. And that works, right? And so, but what I think is the reason is because that our workplaces haven't worked hard enough at really supporting people to what they need when they come into the space. It was always, you were just kind of shoved in this cubicle or this benching system, depending on what was trending at the time of the organization, you know, put their furniture in. And it was like, you just had to figure out how to make that work for you. And if we really step back and start to ask the questions of our employees, get feedback and say, what is it that you need to be empowered to do, have your best day and make these spaces a place that people want to come in. And I bet you'll see that, you know, people are going to want to come back to that. Right. And so I think that we just have to focus a little bit more internally as organizations and go, OK, what do we need to do to level up and to really who do we want to be and, and how do we want to set you know, the precedent going forward and then start to solve better for our people? I mean, preach. That's great. I mean, <laughs> it's a lot of leadership, though, looking inward, right? Versus looking at your employees for that. It's it's like, how? what can we do, right? And, and make it different. And I think something you said previously is you all acquired Room. So if everyone on the call is familiar with Room, it's um, the phone booths and then um, meeting spaces, but all modular. And we, we, full disclosure, have a few at our OWL Labs headquarters, and I'm a huge fan of the brand. But that flexible architecture, right? So part of what you're saying is, is it's not only like almost like the guts and the emotional side of it and how are you building this environment with, with the vibes, right? But also how are you physically building it, right? Um, maybe an open air environment is not the most perfect office environment, right? Because, you know, um, oh, I love it, Jordan, um, <laughs> it is not the best environment because you might be taking a few more video calls from, from people that might not be in office that day. So it's important, right, to also look at the physical architecture. A thousand percent. And I could talk for hours about this. Yeah. And I, uh, but it is, it's about, you know, again, Jordan talks a lot about this too, but it's about choice, right? It's choice for individuals. It's choice for, choice for team, understanding that we have different needs throughout the day. And the only constant in life is change. It's the sure. only thing that is constant. And so we have to make sure we're creating spaces that have the ability to adapt, to evolve, to change, to, you know, be ready for when things are going to, you know, all of a sudden your team grows, your team shrinks. What do we do with the spaces so that we can accommodate? And we were in this, we were in these very fixed environments right now within our workplaces. And it's how do we start to break down that and start to solve with what we call soft architecture, modular architecture furniture, so that it has the ability to, you know, change as the space changes, whether it's the leasing that's changing or whether you're an organization and you're having to make changes because employees are, you know, deciding that they need different things. You're being able to respond to that. You're moving buildings. You're able to take furniture with you. We're not just throwing everything in the landfill. There's so many conversation points around why it is important to solve with these types of products. But it is a huge thing so that we can go ahead and set up spaces so that people have the choice that they need within the, the walls of their workplaces. 
That's great. Now, Jordan, what oh, is yeah, your, go Jordan. <laughs> you have some thoughts or some points here that we'd love to hear about? Yeah, I mean, this is supposed to be a debate. So let's, I want to ju- jump let's in and it. just say there's some, <laughs> some things that I disagree with on. And I, I think where some of this starts is like a lot of trust has been lost with companies in general, because one point that I, I hadn't mentioned about the RTO was that some companies are doing it as a guise for layoffs. And instead of playing people off, they are putting people in position where they're basically needing to um, to leave because they don't have the flexibility that they that they need at this point. And, you know, some people are willing to leave. Some people suck it up and do whatever it is. So I think the question is a little bit loaded when you say, you know, what is it we can do to inspire people to come back to the office? And it's like, that's manipulative, manipulative to me. Instead of inspiring people to come to the office, why don't we inspire them about the mission? Why don't we inspire them about why their work's important? Why don't we inspire them with the transparency of what it is that we're doing? And um, there was a specific comment as well that Ryan made about the seamlessness of speaking with design and then going in another room and manufacturing. And I would argue that's not seamless. I'd argue that's actually really distracting sometimes because if you're in these meetings with these people here and you go over and take this stuff to them, um, there are times in which that that just becomes disruptive when you're just taking stuff into these places and not giving them the choice of like, hey, I'm going to just tap you on your shoulder and start to talk to you about this. Now, obviously, if you have certain meetings that you've arranged, that's something different. But again, I would go back and just to like, this is about remote work is different. It's done differently. And it's done with really great guidelines and documentation and knowledge sharing. So it can be just as seamless to have meetings with design and be able to send that information and package it in a way that manufacturing can now evaluate at their discretion at the time of the day when they need to to do it. So I just want to like add my my thoughts in there because I think sometimes at least when I've been in an office before and I've seen the like the back and forth of like, oh, it's just so easy. I can just go over to that team and talk. Well, that that guy's now like turned around from his computer. He's lost at least 15 to 30 minutes of that productivity on whatever he's working on. And now he's caught into this other meeting that he didn't ask for. Yeah, I'm definitely guilty of that in my office days, I have to say. I'm a vote <laughs> now, but I have definitely been guilty of that. <laughs> Oh, it's, it, it's definitely a part of, and that's that there's good and bad in that, right? Cause there's the serendipitous, you know, moments that actually spark a new idea because somebody just came by and was like, oh, and you're like, oh man. And, and yes, it can be distracting, but it can also be really empowering. And I think some of that too is, you know, again, culturally based on, you know, certain organizations have that kind of policy of what we call like an open door policy where it's like, Hey, come in, you know, if, if there are, you know, if I have my headphones on, if my door is closed, that means I, I need my privacy for whatever that may be. And we have a we have a great culture around here, really understand, um, you know, when that means that I'm in heads down or when that means, you know, I, I don't want to be distracted. Um, you know, so I think that that comes. But I, I also think to your point um, and I, that you're making about I do believe that remote work can be done really, really well. But what I think part of the problem is our main part of the problem is, is that all of most of the organizations we're talking about, they weren't set up to your point to be remote organizations. And so what happens is people aren't trained to be effective leaders with remote workers. Like there was no training on, hey, Molly, now all of a sudden you have three or four remote workers on your team. How I have to lead them in a totally different manner than what I lead with my team in here. And there's there's not been any real good effective training that I've seen presented to me to go, hey, here's how you'd be really effective at coaching and training and and bringing your team along the journey that are remote. And so it's a very hard, all of a sudden it was like, okay, just come back because we know this way. And because these organizations haven't been set up to be really effective. Now, if it's an organization that started through the pandemic or started when remote work or other organizations that were always, you know, remote, but a lot of organizations that were having this conversation about weren't set up that way. And so it's very hard to make that shift and do it effectively where we are taking care of our remote employees just as well as we're taking care of our in, in-house and in-person employees. And I think that's a big challenge. I think it's a really valid point. Um, training is a big deal um, and really important, right? And and managers maybe have not been equipped in the ways that they need to, to, to manage these remote teams, right? We had this big work from home forced experiment, but that's what we said is it's forced. Now we have an opportunity to improve it. Um, and companies really need to lean in there. Um, so I'm going to switch topics a little bit. Um, I hope 
those on the on the line have heard of the term coffee badging. Um, and we like to think we made it a little bit popular this year with our state of fiber work report. Um, but coffee badging is kind of the concept. So it's almost two, two pieces. I think you can look at it, two angles is it's the concept of going in the office for like a badge swipe. So almost a, a, a response to an RTO mandate. You're going to require me to be in the office. You're going to track my badge swipes. I'm going to swipe in. I'm going to have a coffee, catch up with maybe a few colleagues and then head home to get my work completed. Um, so kind of like a modernized way to show face. Um, but it also could be something where someone's almost in, employing that task-based hybrid work. I'm gonna go in the office, I'm gonna swipe, I'm gonna have a coffee, I'm gonna catch up with a few colleagues because the culture component is the most important for me in the office and I'm gonna go home and get my you know individual work completed. So my first question is, do you see coffee badging as a negative? Um, and are you guilty of coffee badging? And Ryan, I'm going to kick it to you first. Yeah, so um, I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily guilty of coffee badging uh, as it as it translates at first blush. Um, I don't have the luxury of driving 20 miles to have a sip of coffee and then head back. <laughs> um, but to go back to uh, some of the earlier points I shared, I'll look at the day as a whole and say, can we can we bump our to dos towards the beginning of the day or towards the end of the day? So I think in essence that could come across as almost like a coffee badging, but I prefer to look at it as you know prioritizing and consolidating what we're here in the office to achieve, because if I can allow my team to avoid something like the rush hour commute, not that I want to encourage extra hours after hours, but in their mind they say it could take me 20 minutes to get home as opposed to an hour and a half. And then I can just be more productive on the couch or at my desk. That's that's how I approach it. So not your classic come in, swipe, be seen, disappear, uh, but more of being smart with the time we have in the office and not, not looking at it as in at 8.30, out at 5.30, but rather in to achieve something and then being efficient with our time that we have in the remainder of the day. I think it's such a great strategy. As I said before, employees want autonomy, right? They want to dictate what they do and where they feel they're most productive. So I feel like adopting that sort of approach, especially for a more structured hybrid approach, I think isn't really smart. And it's the first I've heard of that approach. So I think that's great. Um, Molly, what's your take? Um, do you think coffee badging is a negative? Um, what, what's your take? I honestly, if looked at right, I mean, depending on what lens you're looking at, I know it through, really changes the game. What I love about it and what I love about coming in and grabbing a coffee in our, it's in our social, you know, hub where a lot of, there's a lot of buzz, there's a lot of energy. It's connecting with my, you know, friends and colleagues, you know, grabbing a coffee. I think there's something beautiful in that, right? And if we're looking at it as leadership, you know, it's kind of special that they come in and, you know, come in together, even for that just moment of time. Um, but you can look at it from the other side where somebody's coming in, you know, just to grab their coffee and say, hey, I was here. We don't have a badging system. So it's not like, you know, I don't get to see this a whole lot. But I mean, if it is really just to get my number counted, that's a different type of conversation. I would be looking at that through a different lens. But I think it's just anytime you can get people of your teams together, it's a beautiful thing. And if that means they want to come in for that, that's great. But this goes back to the furniture thing, right? If the only thing great your company has is coffee and they have nothing great for yeah. me to work at and actually spend my day, then I can't blame them for wanting to grab a coffee and, you know, head out and go to their, you know, local coffee shop or a co-working space that actually feels like it supports them better. So. And then Jordan, so this, I, I'm going to kick this to you. And I think in our previous conversation, you used the term cringe, which made me laugh. Um, because I do feel like it is just, it's a very sidestep of employee monitoring, which I have to say, I, I'd be challenged to find a lot of employees that are that are down for that and are interested in that, right? So you use the term cringe. So what is what is your thought here? And, you know, does this, you know, this coffee badging or these badge swipes and being monitored in this way, you know, does that lead to a lack of trust? Like, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if it's used in that way, I mean, I cringe at myself because I haven't been a coffee badger, but I have been a mouse jiggler. And this is like the same principle of like, I, I think about when I first started working remotely and I'll admit like I was not great at it. And like, that's why there is a lot of training that's needed both for leadership as well as, 
you know, people to have like the right setup and to have the mindset. And for some people to like working remotely just won't work. So I want to start with that. But my version of this with remote work was like jiggling the mouse just to make sure that Slack would say I'm, you know, active. Uh, and, and, and I was always just more concerned about appearing productive. I mean, this was over a decade ago, so give me some, cut me some slack, but, uh, I was always just more concerned about appearing productive rather than actually being productive. And this is what, what that reminds me of is like, people are going to do like employees are going to go where the incentivization is. So if they're incentivized to get these swipes, then they're going to get their swipes, but don't expect them to like take it upon themselves to be altruistic and make sure that they get that swipe and then they get a certain amount of productivity in office and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the intention was of that swipe, like they're going to do maybe what the bare minimum is. Some people are going to do what the bare minimum is just to get the swipe. So what if the same investment of time, energy, and intention to track swipes was put into goal setting and tracking outcomes of work right. and put into like the training of like how you can be an effective remote employee or how you can be effective in the office if you want to come into the office. So I think just, yeah, that, that's where it was cringe to me is like, oh, it was almost reminding me of that time of my life as well. And just that feeling of like, I'm cringing because I know that I'm like trying to game the system. Well, I appreciate your honesty here and sharing that. Uh, Being very that, vulnerable with everybody uh, here. Exactly. Now, I, I open really myself up it. now. We really appreciate it. Um, okay, so we'll ask one more question and then we'll get into some Q&A. Um, so I'd be remiss not to talk about AI because everybody else is. Um, so I would probably say this is the hottest topic happening right now with some companies like LinkedIn went on record and did some layoffs because they were outsourcing um, those functions to AI. So they went on record and said it, right? So my question, I guess, here is, is do you currently implement AI tools in your day-to-day? -day? Um, and if you do, how do you use them? Um, and do you think that's just going to continue to increase? So Molly, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah. Um, so anybody that's on my team that is on this call will be laughing because this was a very hard topic for me to swallow when AI was first kind of presented to us, the chat GPTs of the world and trying to get us as a marketing team comfortable with it. And I was, I was very anxious about the idea of what this whole thing was going to do. These, this idea of these robots and what they were going to take over and all this stuff they were going to do and what's going to happen to my children and, you know, and all of this. And, and, I really was a negative naysayer and we were going to lose our voice as a company and that, you know, all of the things that just felt very robotic to it. Um, but I am a per I use it every single day and my team uses it every day. Um, we lean into it really heavily, especially the chat GPT and helping us, you know, get started with different ideas, writing up different things for, you know, social posts and marketing um, things. I also, I, I had mentioned, I do um, a lot of the product introductions. I've had product designers that have said, I generated this product idea through, you know, the AI softwares. And I'm like, oh my, I mean, it's bizarre. But what I think is what we have to do as a society, as a world is to lean into it because if we don't lean in. It is going to be our jobs that are going to be taken. It is a tool for us. And if we can really understand the benefits and the, 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 what it can do for us, let it take the monotony of our job and then let us like level up all of our gifts, you know, and try to use our creativity to become better and more effective at our jobs. And yes, it is going to take jobs. I mean, there's no question that that is going to happen. So we have to, as these people, really start to diversify ourselves, right? And start to know what it is, what the value is that we bring each and every day and to really lean into that and allow this tool to be that support system that it needs to be to us to help us be more effective every day. And Jordan, same question to you. Are you implementing it in your day to day? Absolutely. I live and breathe this stuff, like everything. Uh, constantly using it. I'm in different AI masterminds. My team all uses AI to execute. I'm always looking for new use cases, anything from helping job seekers with their resumes to planning conversations with my girlfriend that I know are going to be really difficult, um, which is really helpful, actually. Um, and I, I just think, like, if you don't build AI literacy, um, you will become obsolete. Like th this is, I think this is more drastic than what most people are giving it credit for. Like 
traditional job roles are are going away. Like the current way that we work is going away. I mean, in, in a similar way, how remote work has impacted how work gets done. I think this is even more like this because this takes the actual human capital needs out of it. And it's a little bit scary. Like I try not to be super pessimistic about it, but mm -hmm. I find myself in like these really uh, dystopian conversations like quite frequently and maybe I'm too close to all this stuff. But um, yeah, it's... I, I think at this point, like if you lag behind it now, you're you're gonna be in trouble. That's I think that's good just advice generally. And I think Molly, you might have said previously that it's like a human machine collaboration, right? Like it's not going to take over our job stakes. You need that human touch. But I think Jordan, you're right about you have to be proficient in it or you could get lapsed. And I think Jordan, you might have shared, think about writing a CV or resume and all your skills. Like you, I think you said that, you know, AI and proficiency in AI and what tools and platforms will probably be a part of that, um, which is very interesting, I thought to me. And then Ryan, I know you are in, um, you know, the financial sector, which I think is probably for uh, many reasons, slower to adopt like an AI type platform tool strategy. If you're not employing it now, do you think this, the, the industry will evolve? um sooner than later or or still just try to keep it out no 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 i don't think it's intentionally keeping it out i think it's being mindful of the repercussions thinking down the road of how might this you know affect uh, customer security or or data um i think you're going to see industries like finance like healthcare they're going to be really careful as they approach it because what they don't want to do is put their end users at risk or introduce any unnecessary exposure what I will say is, even if we say these two industries say, oh, we're not going to get into it right now, we're going to see how things pan out. The reality is between Outlook and even things like PowerPoint, AI is already built into some of those where you're working and all of a sudden it says, already, yeah. have you considered X, Y, Z? And you go, well, no, I haven't. Let's explore that more. It's It's coming through these other tertiary channels. The question is, are we actually labeling it correctly or are we just using it and ignoring the fact that it is actually artificial intelligence in the background? So I think it'll come. I just think they're taking a cautious step and they're doing it for the right reasons. So um, I, I imagine it'll it'll show up. It's just a matter of when and in what form. Okay, great. Um, so thank you everybody. This was fantastic. Um, we're gonna launch in a few Q and A, a few questions that I think Kate's going to be our, our VOG or who she is. Great. Yes. And Hi, behind, behind the scenes, Kate here. here. <laughs> um, so there's some great questions in the chat, actually. And so uh, for those that are still with us here, if you want to go into the Q&A function and give a question that you want to see our panelists answer a like, I can make sure to get to those uh, sooner rather than later. But to kick us off, let's start with what strategies do you use to foster a collaborative, inclusive, and positive organizational culture? when you have both in-person and fully remote employees. Molly, why don't you take that first one? I feel like you've got that mix of both. Yeah, and that's where um, I go back to just the intentionality. It's and, and this is where I was talking about, there's not a lot of training out there, or at least that I've been exposed to of like, here's how to best support your remote versus best support your in-person. So we've kind of created our own strategies as a team and what works. And so, you know, making sure that we are meeting X amount of time. So we, for our team, we do, you know, the bi-monthly, um, you know, calls where we're all together. We try to keep those, you know, really intentional to try to make sure that we're there for one another so that we're seeing each other on the screen. And it could still be tactical stuff that we're going through, but it's just this ability to see one another. I think that that's hugely important. And just to assume that people are doing the jobs or trying to just use chat back and forth all the time, I think it's really important that we see one another, um, even if it is on a screen. And, and then trying to be really um, intentional about those those times that we get together and making the most out of those times. And, and we're learning as a team. I, I didn't have this uh, remote team a year ago. So it is, it's a work in progress and it's just trying to learn how to best take care of one another. And, and Jordan, I hope you can come into like these organizations really help us to, you know, start to empower our, you know, remote employees as much as we are internal. Because I it's never intentional, um, but you definitely have those serendipitous moments and those things that are happening by the water cooler here when you guys are all together and you don't mean to leave out that conversation for that remote employee. And so 
really thinking through and keeping very specific, you know, um, even notes of, hey, I have to make sure that I just had this talk at the down by in the cafe. I need to make sure the rest of my team knows that, you know, and so just really being intentional in every step of the way is kind of how we've been kind of slowly creating our own um, version of strategies on on best ways to connect the the remote employees versus the internal. And also it comes down to product too, like having the right tools, the right softwares, the right products that are making those interactions really um, valuable because there's there are a lot of times our offices weren't set up for that because we weren't doing a lot of remote, you know, uh, types of conversations. And so you have these long linear tables and people are up on a screen, you'd forget they're even there being really thoughtful about what that experience is like for everybody and not just thinking about the people in the room, but even more so about the people that are not in, in there and what that's like for them, I think is going to be really, really important as we go forward. I think that's great. And shameless plug for our yes. last week, that <laughs> hybrid technology that brings everybody into this space so you can see everyone. Um, that was great. Thank you. Really insightful. Um, Kate, do you have another question for us? Yes. Uh, what do you all believe the impact will be on promotions and career paths for those working fully remote? Jordan, what do you think? What are, what are you, I mean, what do you, what do you think? What do you hear? What do you see? Hmm. I, well, a lot of that depends on the culture of the company, right? Cause okay. you're going to have a lot of uh, companies that for one reason or another, if they don't have that intention around remote work, then there'll be some distance bias or there'll be some type of bias that they might have towards people that are in the office that they see every day that are at the water cooler that are in those situations. So um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but I think, I think um, for those that are looking for promotional opportunities within remote work, like what I often have them look at is where are the most distributed companies that have intentionally been remote since inception. And, you know, mm -hmm. they are the most competitive companies to work at, but those are the companies where, you know, that kind of thing, like, the promotion, uh, the ability to move upwards is, um, is there within remote, but yeah, it's, it's tough. It's hard to say that, um, it depends on the company, right? Like it depends mm -hmm. on the company's culture. It depends on how they view it. And it's not like a company's going to come out and say that they're biased, Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, take a look well, at the actions and it might say something different. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. I mean, proximity bias is definitely a concern, right? Um, of a lot of employees. I think we covered a little bit of it in our in our data report this year. Um, for us at OWL, we were always remote. So I don't think I said at the top, but I've always been a remote employee based in New York City, and now I'm in Connecticut. And um, and every time we do a promotion run, um, everyone celebrated internally. It's like a 50, 50 of who's been in office and who's remote. Um, so we're just really mindful. Sometimes I think that happens versus us being so intentional about it, but really it's, um, it's promoting and recognizing based on experience versus, you know, proximity, which is really tough to do. Um, okay. So Kate, do you have another question for us? Yes. Okay. This is a good one. As employees decide where the best place to work is, how do you help them balance what they need versus what others need from them? For example, I'm more productive at home versus my team is more productive when I'm with them. So Ryan, how would you tackle this? Because I feel like you have, you almost have this. I mean, maybe you have this problem or challenge. Yeah, um, I think oftentimes, and this isn't just in this new hybrid remote in office environment we find ourselves in, I think historically, teams have sometimes mistakenly hired other people that are like them. And you start to wind up with, we all love to be in the office or we all love to work in this style. The issue is if you have a singular mindset when approaching problem solving or achieving goals. That's a dangerous thing to have. You've got this group think going on. So um, I've always looked to add a little bit of, uh, you know, different perspectives and views into the team members that I bring in. Part of the responsibility in doing that is making sure that you're setting up an environment that they can succeed in, which means different work styles. I literally brought someone in just a few months ago, um, and we've been working on communication styles. I have a certain way of communicating. She has a certain way of communicating. We both agree neither one is wrong. We have to work on how we communicate so that I get what I need and she gets what she needs. So I think it's really about just being open and honest. And I know sometimes that's not as easy as, as it sounds, but in saying, here's what I need to be successful, and I understand what you need, and then when do we make that adjustment 
on behalf of the needs of the other person. So uh, it's really just open, honest dialogue. Uh, mm -hmm. I run my organizations pretty flat. Um, I know that's not everywhere. And I know that sometimes that's even frowned upon because it's not seen as, you know, obeying the hierarchy, but it's saying what you need, articulating it, and then actually at times, maybe justifying it. I need it because X, Y, Z, the other person can then say, maybe there's another way to do it. Or I didn't realize that you were facing this barrier. I'm more than happy to make concessions on my side. So open lines of communication and just being mindful that, you know, we're all just trying to do the best we can. Um, yeah. That Brian, helps. you sound like a great manager. I love it. Fingers, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have my team come in. <laughs> exactly. Pull the team, right? Yeah. Um, no, that's great. That's that, I think that's so important. Transparency and open communication, right? And then also just being receptive as a manager. Um, I think is important, even if the answer might have to be no in some cases, I think being receptive to the conversation is really important. But um, being, being able to articulate why it's a no, right? That's, exactly. that's communication. It's not just exactly. no, because it's yeah. no, and here's the reason behind it. And then maybe in the future, if things change, we can both agree, we've seen it change, and now we can go back. So it it is the communication that's key. For sure. Kate, do you think we have time for one more question? Or do you think that we should... We should sign yeah, up. Let's, let's do okay. one more because this seemed to be a popular one. Um, how are new staff members being mentored in a hybrid model? But I think also Jordan could speak to in a remote model, how new staff members are mentored. Yeah, Jordan, do you, I'd be curious to hear your take on this and like, how is it being done well, I guess? Yeah, at least from what I've seen, I mean, just constant check-ins. I mean, for, for me and my own personal team and like how I've done mentorship is that uh, typically with each person, it's a little bit different based on their needs, based on their personality profile. But mm -hmm. I do want to have at least a few meetings a week with them. And mm -hmm. I want to have them shadowing me while I'm working. So we do a lot of co-working sessions, like virtual co-working, where mm -hmm. we talk about the goals in which we want to accomplish during the session. And then we kind of break, like we're, we're still on the video call together, but we're both working on our own thing. And at the end of the 50 minutes, we, we wrap and talk about what we worked on and then make sure that the person gets the support that they need. Um, and just having those virtual co-working sessions for me have been really good if they have intention to them and um, if they're, if they feel like they're supported. So virtual co-working is, is just like a major game changer for me in, in every aspect. Like I use it for getting into deep focus, but it's also great as a mentorship tool. Okay, great. Um, so this was really insightful. Um, I enjoyed the chat. I hope you all did too. Um, panelists and also attendees. Um, I think we just shared in the chat, a book that Jordan wrote, um, I, I highly encourage you checking it out. Um, we'll also follow up, I think, with a recording and then also a link to State of Hybrid Work so you all have it as well. But thank you for tuning in. And if you have any feedback, like we'd love to hear it. Um, any questions we didn't touch on that we should consider in the future, please share it. But, um, but this was great. And thank you for the time and the insights. This was great. Have a good rest of your day, wherever you are located. If it's night, morning, wherever it might be. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.